What's happening? Happy Veterans Day here in America. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, and your core hardcore fan page. You know, I'm a little distracted today. There's actually a band playing outside my window. And I live in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. They're, they're set up right in the street on a little bandstand and they're playing they're playing uh, John Denver right now. Country home, take me home where I'm West Virginia. Listen, New York ain't what it used to be, but it's the only place for me. What's happening? What's happening, gang? What's happening, John? What's happening in Scotland, Robert? What up, what up? Chris Hoffman, what's happening? Philip Oki, what's happening? The whole gang. Hey, Lori, how are you? Good to see every... Yeah, kind of in the rain, bro. Yeah, it's a kind of a nasty day, and they're out there playing. Hey, um, Johnny Rock, what's up? Hear me calling, Johnny Rock. What's up? Nick Esposito, upstate New York. Keep it real up there. Love upstate New York. Love it. What's up, Greg? Hope you're well, buddy. Hey, uh, while we're at it, just want to remind you uh, that this Sunday, next show on this Sunday, we got the El Nino guys coming up. Dave Chevalier and Laz from uh, El Nino. Yo, Laz is an old friend of mine going way back. He worked on all the music videos with me that I did, the Biohazard stuff and Agnostic Front. Laz was there through my whole music video run. I'm really proud of him. You know, he stuck with it and uh stuck with it get with it he stuck with it and uh you know he hung in there and, and ended up in el nino and uh did all right for himself um after the after the il, il nino show a week from today we're super stoked on this on this we're super stoked on this we got keith burkhart from cause for alarm coming on the show uh like I said, not on social media at all. Sort of uh, hard to get in touch with this guy, but uh, he's a fan of the show, and uh, and that's what's up. That's right. What's up, Astoria Lou? Vroom Helda, absolutely. Hey, Johanna. What's going on in Pennsylvania? Curtis, what's up in Canada, bro? Yep. Si, senor. El Nino. That's right. Happy Veterans Day, everyone. All the... All, uh, all the all the veterans out there, man. Happy Happy Veterans Day. You know what? You know who I want to shout out? I got to shout this guy out right here. Big shout out right here. I want to shout out my dad, Arnie Stone, Army veteran. Here he is in December of 1954 with his tank. He served in the Korean War conflict. That's my dad from the Bronx driving a tank, yo. Dad was driving a, 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 it's just a tank driving motherfucker right there. And uh, wait, I got another one. Hold on. Another shot. Hold on. Here's my dad and his buddies. My dad and his buddies out there during the Korean War. Actually, this was in Germany, he told me. Yep. Yeah, man. <laughs> Here he is. You know, my dad told me an interesting thing that like all the guys from his neighborhood in the Bronx got drafted at the same time and they all went in together and they all did basic training together. And a lot of them ended up uh, being stationed together. So yeah. Yep. Oh, right on, right on Boris. So yeah. What one last, one last, hold on. Where, where's the Arnie stone icon? Hold on. One more words of wisdom from Arnie stone. Let, let me, uh, one more, one more Arnie stone one. Here's my dad on top of his tank. Here we go. One more time. Happy Veterans Day, everybody. There you go. April 1955. My old man was driving a tank, yo. Hard. Think you're hard? <laughs> so there you go. That said, let's uh let's bring on Stephen Messina, uh, who is in the in the in the store in the storage hut today. What's, What's up? up? I'm in storage today. You're in storage, huh? That's it. That's it. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in the. I'm in the. I'm in with the gloves here today. Hey, listen. Let me get a box of gloves. 
What do you need, XLs, man? I got XLs. Here. Glo gloves. Is that with powder or without powder? I have both. Some Isn't the powder just, thing? Doesn't the powder thing get you sick or something? Yeah, you don't want the powder. No one likes the powder. The powder, yo. Stay away from the powder. Listen, where is where's my where's photos of the day? Photo of the day today, people. Hold on, what happened to the photos of the day? Happy Veterans Day, by the way, to Arnie Stone. So yeah, man. My dad too. My dad was Korea as well. He was in a heavy cruiser. In a heavy Navy. cruiser? Yeah, the USS Salem. Oof. Yeah. Nice. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, this is photo of the day. Wrong answers only, please. Mm. We are only interested in wrong answers to begin with. Here we go. Hardcore shutterbug photo of the day. Boom. There you go. Let's hear it. And, you know, we definitely, a, a menudo is always a good answer. <laughs> so here we go. Let's see, Let's what, see we, what we got. What do we got here? Hey, Vinny Doke, how you doing, bro? I hope you're feeling all right. Vinny. No powder. Okay. No, only wrong answers we're interested in. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's okay. Here we go. Is it iced tea? Is it Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince? <laughs> Is it John Denver? Good one. Country home, take me, huh? All right. Is it, is it Migos and Con A? Is it Pat Boone? Okay. I'm going deep here. Whoa. Wow, this one. Yo, Steven and Morita. I think you nailed it, bro. Hold on. Oh, hold on. Here's wait, there's another you sent me a couple, right? Yes, I did. Let me uh let me put up another one. Let me put up another one. Hold your horses. Hold your horses. That's a good one. You don't hear that too much anymore. Hold your horses. That's big in my house still. Yeah. All right. Is it Steely Dan? Good guess. <laughs> Is it Arsenio Hall? Another good guess. Millie Vanilli. Is it Dave Chappelle? Gigi Allen. Gigi. <laughs> Bite it, you scum. Yeah. It's in vanilla ice. Okay. All right. Here All we right. go. Let's let's Let see. hear it now. You know what? I like this one right here. Some this guy really got it. Are you ready? Yep. Is it Public Enemy with Sisters of Mercy at Radio City? Wow. Hold on. I got the third picture of the series. Holy shit. I got the third picture of the series to put up. Hold on. Damn, I'm impressed. Yeah, bro. Dude nailed it. Here you go. Bam. Yes. Yes, Look Steve. Look at that. Steve, you win. It is Public Enemy with Sisters of Mercy at Radio City. So give us a little background on this. Wow. Well, first of all, yes. This is dead on nailed it. This was July 24th, my birthday, actually. This is July 24th, 1991. This is 29 years ago. And the bill was pretty crazy. It was Sisters of Mercy, Gang of Four, Public Enemy, and opening, like they had their own little opener, and that was the Young Black Teenagers and Warrior Soul. And uh, I'm a big, big, big Warrior Soul fan. And they were just killing it. They were still on their first or second album at the time. And uh, yeah, it's, it's funny because the thing that made me laugh was that Public Enemy was announcing that they were going to be the first hip hop band to play Radio City. And yet they brought out an opener, this band, the Young Black Teenagers, who went on before them. <laughs> so technically, they so were the first hip hop band. The first, so technically. Right. You, oh, is that you, right? Is that Young Black? Twist the bottle and twist the cap. That's that yes, it? yes. Twist that's the bottle that. and twist the cap. So they were the yeah. first hip hop band to and play Radio City. City. Tap the bottle, tap yeah. the bottle and twist the cap. Yeah, sure, I remember that. And uh, and the funny thing about the young black teenagers is they were a bunch of white kids. So that's right. The that's um, right. but it was a great, really eclectic bill because you had Warrior Soul who were still on their. First, I think the first album, the first Geffen album, which was like a really heavy kind of like trippy band. You had Public Enemy, who are awesome. At that point, they were like at their peak. And then you had Gang of Four. Goth pop. 
you know, you had Gang of Four, uh, which is a band that's kind of hard to even describe. And then, of course, the Sisters of Mercy. And uh, really cool bill that you didn't, you don't see too many bills like that where it was just a little bit of everything, you know. And yeah, uh, well, that's what Upstate Rick says. Mixed yeah. mixed bills are extinct. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a beautiful thing, and I think that's what Perry Farrell was really going for when he first put Lollapalooza together. Yeah, you right. Know? Sure. And uh, it's just mind blowing to me that this is 29 years ago. This is almost 30 years now, and. Uh, I just cool feeling like a fucking dinosaur, feeling old, man. But uh, you know, I remember, I remember Public Enemy. Um, was it Murphy's? No, that was Murphy's Law. No, no, it was it was Beastie Boys, Murphy's Law, and Public Enemy. I saw that tour. I actually worked on. There's a VHS out there. It's live from the Capitol Theater, and and I worked on that. I was like the second assistant director on that. I, you know, I gotta say personally, Chuck D might just be my all-time favorite like rap voice just for anyone out there in the, in the game he is to me like when i i always loved just that he had that booming voice and i always just you know he he was just really always articulate and intelligent and uh you know and that's why i really enjoyed when he got in with uh why can't I think of that? With the Prophets of Rage, with the, you know, with the uh, yeah, Rage Against cool. the Machine guys, you know, and just uh, one of my all-time favorites, absolute legend to me, you know? Right on. Cool. So, okay. Good. That's well, that. I'm, gl I'm glad you're on the clock today. And I am on the clock. I'm glad you're getting paid. I'm glad you're getting paid to do the show. You know what? You need At least someone is. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. I'll talk and, to you in uh, a bit. You got it. See everybody in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Now I remember, I think the video was called The Skills to Pay the Bills. Was that it? It was like, had all this, it was all, you know, what time is it? Time to get ill and all that. You hear my voice in the video. I got to dig that out. Actually, that reminds me. You know what? That's not even in my, uh, in my, in my, what do you call it? My resume. That you, just you just reminded me of that. I got, I got to dig that up. Um, that said, here you go. It is that time, everybody. Is everybody ready for the new, the intro, the Rap Bones intro? Let me clear the deck. Let's bring on Rap Bones. Here we go. We're going to do the, the, the brand new first time Rap Bones intro. Here we go. Rap Bones! Rap Bones! Rap Bones! Rap Bones! Rap Bones! Rap Bones! And there he is. <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. Yeah, bro. Oh, it's so menacing. It, you, you know what? It's so good. Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! So I had to play it twice. It's so good. Yeah, every, look, everyone likes it. It's I a big it. hit already. Nice. I, Amazing. I, uh, Badass. <laughs> I love it. All right, let's jump into it, bro. What do you got? I got a little bit today, but I got a pretty serious segment. I've been working on it. I got it all sitting in front of me. We're going to run it. I want to say happy Veterans Day. Love love our vets. We got we to gotta protect ourselves. I found these in the lobby. I thought these were cool. Happy Veterans Day. My you, found those in the lo you found those in the lobby of your building? Uh, yeah, just whatever. Someone put them down there. Those well, are cool. Right, right. I don't, I don't find yo. I don't find cool shit like that in my lobby. Well, it comes to me. I'm a junk magnet. I hate it. Some people are yeah. chick magnets. Some people are junk magnets. No doubt. So <laughs> look, let's let's jump right into it because I got a lot of things happening. I want to start off with saying sometimes collecting is like little tiny things become a collectible because of sentiment. So I have even things like this I won't throw out. Nice. You know, uh, who remembers sounds? Remember sounds, Drew? Come on, bro. On St. Mark's, bro. Yeah. So yep. I think those are cool. And I'm bringing that up to segue into one of my favorite record stores, and I want to announce something that's going on. I'm going to come back into Generation Records Want to give a shout out to Mark and Ron and all the guys that work over at Generation Records. I'm gonna do more like a 
one item, two items at a time. You can go in there and buy it. But uh, I'm actually uh, – those shirts we showed off on the Patreon, those are actually going to be up on eBay, I believe, Thursday or Friday. So if you want to check out their uh, – you know, the website, I went in there yesterday and I love generation for this reason too. I went in there yesterday and I bought this cassette for like four bucks, right? It's like a great, uh, HR record. It's a little more obscure than some of the stuff he puts out. I really love it. You know, with a lot of the stuff, it's like, if I grew up and it was part of my life at one point, then I really can appreciate it. But the coolest part about that is I bought this very charged record in 1989, probably like in the same spot because that's where the H's are, right? On that same cassette wall. Yo, they so, coming for you, bro? Huh? They coming for you? No, they're not coming for me. That's outside. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going right, to uh I also just want to let everybody know really quick, this shirt is going to be available at Generation Records. So if you can't get to me through the mail or, you know, it, just this one though. So if you like this in white, it's the uh, stage flip over Armand at the B and B for rest in pieces. You know, done down into cartoon style there. So that's going to be available over there too. And then let's get right into the collectible. I'm going kind of smalls today because I like it. But uh, I started collecting picks for a friend in Germany. He got me into the pick game. I wasn't really big on picks. I didn't care. Guitar picks? Them. But these are just some of the guitar picks I got right now. I really like that Sheer Tower one. You know, and I got these from the people. It's, it's nice when you get something right out of somebody's hand, you know? Billy Club. Ooh, I like the AF one. Yeah, AF, and then uh, we love a story of Soundworks. New Faith used to practice there. Are we doing? Are we doing guitar picks today? Because my guitar, you got oh, some God. guitar picks. Run it. That's the Craig Silverman. Woo! Now you're talking my language. And then, if we're doing a couple guitar picks, yeah, throw it in there. All right, let me see what I got. Go ahead. Are we gonna go one? Are we gonna go one for one? Are we gonna battle? I got mine on the run. You want to battle? I'll, I'll be, okay, you ready? Go, my lead off? You ready for my lead off? What do you got? DD Ramon, bro. DD motherfucking Ramon right there. I can go at you with a CBGB's pick. All right, I'm not mad at that. How about no, you know. how about Metallica? Well, I, I, I picked it up in their rehearsal room when I was shooting the Alago film. I'll see your this Metallica. Is actually, this is actually, I think, one of Robert's picks because it's the size of a taco chip. I will see your Metallica, and I'll raise you a Megadeth. Ooh. I see your Megadeth. I see your Megadeth. I don't know what year that is, but that's the back of it. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. What you got? What you got? I see your Megadeth. I raise you a Cowboys from Hell. Dimebag Daryl pick. What? Ooh, I, from the Cowboys from Hell Tour, bro. I see that. I see that. But I got to roll with a Zach Wild pick. I don't Listen, know. He, was, he replaced. Don't make me push you, bro. Don't make me. He replaced Randy somehow. He's a little stronger, bro. A little bit, a little bit. But then I got this. This is one of my favorite picks. This, and that's, a, that's an 80s pin. How about Black Sabbath, Geezer, oh, Geezer Sabbath Butler, Butler right? Black Sabbath, Geezer Butler. I love that Eddie pin, right? So, yeah, these are some smalls I got. I, Slayer! <laughs> I got a Slayer. I guess the most obscure pick I have that you wouldn't think I have is this. Uh, I worked uh, production for a little while, and we did the first gig I was on was uh, Madonna. She was out in the warehouse out in Brooklyn. And the first night... I found that in the state, like on the stage, we were tearing. I didn't that. know Madonna. I didn't know Madonna played guitar. Go figure. Uh, she plays guitar. Yes. Listen. Pretty cool. Hey, you know what? Suck on this, bro. Ooh, that's nice. Rick Rick Nielsen, cheap trick. Hey, that's a good one. Oh, you know what? Here's a personal favorite of mine right here. 
What you Surfing got? What with you the got? alien, bro. Joe Satriani. Oh, that's a nice one. Oh, here. Here's another <laughs> one. Yo, all worn down. Ingve Malmsteen. <clears throat> oh, I can't top that. My Adrian Smith is my top of the mark. And I don't think I never Gene saw that. Gene Simmons. Or Gene Simmons. <laughs> all right. You guys, listen, can I get one shout out in since I don't get yeah, it? Yeah, hurry, hurry up. We're behind. I got to bring our guests. I want to shout out my man, Doug Dillon from California. His band is Ill Content. Check them out. They're old, like DRI style, lethal aggression. They're actually on, uh, what is that right there? Trip Squad Records, which is our buddy, uh, Tim McMurdo from Full Blown Chaos. So check out Ill Content. This record rips, you know, totally like badass hardcore. DRI, COC, Vane, that kind of XL. So cool. that's my boy, Doug. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate you, brother. And uh, that's my shout out. And uh, let's see what's going on. I'm excited to watch the show today. All right. We'll see you in a bit. All right, guys. This is your outro. Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rainbow! Rainbow! Don't even get me started on the guitar pick shit because honestly, I got rid I've gotten rid of everything like in my life. Like I don't want anything. I didn't I got rid of like the, the records and the t-shirts and the wives and the kids. I don't want nothing. But I held on to the bag of 35 years of guitar picks. I could go all day with this guitar pick thing. Seriously. But, but that's that's for another show. Um, that said, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, Texas Silver Rush, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page, and Shane Reaction Records and Skateboards, which is located in Lakewood, Colorado. It's the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. Also, while we're at it, let's shout out our boy Joe Romini at the Texas Silver Rush. It's a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo, photos, social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Flamer Flamers. Rock and Roll Hall of Flamers, Greg Rollet, Ringo Starr, of course, Agnostic Front. During this current pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page, and of course, www.texassilverrush.com. There you go. That said, let's get cracking. Let's bring our guest on. Here, let me, let me make sure everybody's okay in there. There's no drama in, 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 in the... Uh, in the chat room, everybody cool? Everybody behaving? Nobody, no disruptors today? Here we go. Today's guest is an English drummer and session musician, best known for his work in post-punk and industrial groups, including Public Image Limited, Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, Pig Face, The Damage Manual, Brian Brain, and Killing Joke. He also works as a consultant, has written books, is an honorary board member of the nonprofit organization Rock for Kids and is the music business program coordinator at Millican University. Please welcome, coming at us from Chicago, the land of Lincoln in the great state of Illinois, Mr. Martin Atkins. What's happening? Hey, how you doing, Drew? I'm good. Thanks for coming on, buddy. What a crazy bunch of motherfuckers you've got on the show. I know. <laughs> today, was a, today was a little crazy. But, you know, it's a good thing we got going here, you know, and you of all people would know what's happened here is, you know, build it and they will come is a community. People from around the world come here. Uh, you know, there's a lot going on in the chat room. And it's just it's just the culture of music that 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 you and I are, are just love and are a part of. Yeah, it's great to see. It's great to see. So what's the latest, man? Uh, what was happening when the zombie apocalypse hit? Well, uh, I, we, I was kind of fortunate. Um, we have a, an event that we do with, with my students at Millican. Um, it's called Midwest Music uh, Expo. We were supposed to do it on May the 9th. 
and it's an in-person event on the campus. It's a beautiful campus. And I'm like, you know what, students, we've got to cancel this. Um, and so we reluctantly canceled the event. But within a couple of weeks, we'd started to do free workshops, screen printing workshops, the interview stuff, things like this online. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm like, you know what, we should, we, let's switch to virtual. So we did our conference virtually May the 9th. We tripled our attendees. Instead of people from a 200 mile radius, we had people from 23 countries. So since then, since May the 9th, I've just been going crazy doing stuff, <laughs> helping people out, doing events. Uh, probably 70, 80 events since May. Wow. Teaching my students, trying to show people that there are um, uh, there are alternatives other than curling into a ball and getting under the blanket. So, you know, there's, there's really good stuff going on right now, for sure. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's a new world, you know, and, and some people are adjusting and embracing it. And, and some people, you know, are, 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 are sort of waiting for it to blow over. Personally, I don't think it's ever going, it's, it's not ever going to be back to the past is dead. Long live the past. I'm a firm believer in that. Well, if I, I'm sure all of your listeners will love it when I mention Melissa Etheridge, <laughs> <laughs> but She's been killing it. Oh, thank you, Marie Dawn. Uh, she's been killing it. The, like the day the pandemic, she she went on Facebook for 57 days in a row. Wow. Uh, she stopped doing free concerts at three o'clock every day when her son uh, died to do with uh, opioids. But now she's on um, Maestro, Melissa Etheridge TV or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. she's, she has a thousand subscribers at $50 a, a month. Nice. A seven camera studio setup that's fully mobile. So when when it does get back to normal ish, she's going to take her seven camera studio on the road with her and maintain that connection and asterisk the revenue stream. Yeah, you know, she's it's not going to go back to normal. So you know, for me, I'm going to have a Zoom chat on my drum riser. I'm going to have a, a a Zoom cam in my bunk. So people can watch myself cry myself to sleep in pain after a pig face show. You know, <laughs> it's just it's not going to go back to the way things were. This this technology is too amazing, and people are being forced to become. Hey, Eric, people are being forced to become au fait with it. You know, uh, and uh, you gave me a tutorial in, in Streamyard for that one day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you know, Zoom, StreamYard, OBS, bring it on, bring it on. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities. You know, I, I, I really am. You know, and uh, so, hey, tell us, um, where did you grow up? How did you grow up? How did music come into your life? Uh, uh, so I was born in Nuneaton, which is close to Coventry, close to Birmingham, close to Wolverhampton. Oh, Somebody sure. in uh, Giza Butler. I actually did a track with Giza Butler. For wow. Me. Combat. Yeah, it's on the Mortal Kombat uh, soundtrack. Nice. Uh, you saw my Geezer Butler pick I pulled out before, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I I uh, grew up in Leeds and then in Durham, which is close to Newcastle, which wow. is where I started drinking uh, Newcastle Brown Ale. Wasn't Coventry, let me ask you, wasn't Coventry, if I remember correctly, isn't that where the specials and the selector yeah, I saw. Isn't that whole? Isn't that whole two tone scene from Coventry? Yeah, I saw. I saw it when they were called the Coventry Specials. Oh, nice! At the seventy seven club in Nuneaton. But Ooh. I started drumming when I was nine. Um, my dad bought me a drum kit. He heard that I did well on the snare drum in the music class. I was randomly given a snare drum. If I'd been if I'd been given a xylophone, this would be a very different conversation you know um and so i started to play drums every day for four or five hours if my dad had got me a lawnmower this would be an interview on horticultural weekly you know <laughs> fathers and sons right my dad got me a drum kit so i played it for four hours a day to uh um to impress my dad um i started uh joined my first band when i was 11 started drinking newcastle brown ale when i was 12 <laughs> Strippers when I was 12, 
um, and I joined PIL in, moved to London, joined PIL in 79. Was, was um, I assume you were maybe, you were, you were in a couple of bands before that, uh, local stuff, and, and then, and then you, you, tell us about the, 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 the uh, audition for, for, for PIL, um, how did that go down? Well, so I was in a bunch of kind of prog rock, um, Mellotrons. I nice. Mean, I mean, we used to play like Todd Rundgren. Like Gentle Giant and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hawkwind. <laughs> so, yeah. So when, when punk came along, it's like, here's a chord, here's another, here's another starter band. I'm like, no. I've been playing for four hours a day since I was nine. <laughs> you know? I, was, I was good when I was, by the time I was 16, I'd been playing for seven years. I was good. Um, so I missed an audition with Pill the, for the for the first spot when Jim Walker joined. Mm -hmm. I was London for some auditions, and I saw an ad in Melody Maker, drummer required for band with rather well known singer. And I called. Did, up, you, did you know who it was when you saw that? Oh, yeah, I'm like, oh, it's fucking. This is John's new thing, and so I called up. Hello, Virgin Records. I'm like, oh fuck, this is John's new thing, and. Um, I'm like, when are the auditions? Because I'm really good and I don't give a fuck and I'm sick of being in these prog rock bands. And then um, auditions are Friday. You sound great. We'll get you in. And I'm like, I've got to leave tonight. Can I have an audition this afternoon? And they're like, no, the auditions are Friday. And I had to go back up to the north of England. I had a ride on a truck. I had no money. Um <clears throat> But with every mile that the truck left London going back up to Newcastle, I'm like, ah, oh, you just fucked up, Martin. As soon as I got back, I called the band I was in. They were, they were called The Mind, M-Y-N-D. Um, I said, I'm moving to London. Like, I was like maybe 17. And uh, they called me back. They said, you're right. We're moving to London too. So we all moved to London. I got a job working for the government, just for Trafalgar Square. I used to have my sandwich sitting underneath Nelson's column. Every <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, in that, that first year and a half of Pill, maybe two years, they went through like eight drummers. They set Carl Burns on fire. Um, they, Jim Walker left. Uh, Richard Dudansky. Like, they went through a ton of drummers. And so... Um, Eventually, uh, I got a call to go over to the townhouse. I'm calling everybody. I'm calling Virgin. I got to know Jeanette Lee. I got to know Jeanette Lee's mom because she <laughs> was in one day when I called. And so I just talk, start talking to her mom. And I went to the townhouse studios, um, which is where Phil Collins recorded In the Air Tonight. Queen were there. Um, and uh, I thought it was an audition, right? And some, I walk into this huge fucking studio. It's the size of a basketball court. And somebody said, yeah, the, the drums are over there. And uh, I sit down behind the kit and I put, I put the headphones on. Never done that before. I put the headphones on and somebody goes, rolling. And that first five and a half minutes was Bad Baby. The wow. Song. Bad baby, bad baby from uh from metal box. That it was in metal box. I'm met, excuse me, on metal box. And uh, um that was my first five and a half minutes in the band. And then oh, the next day I went back to work working for the government and um had a kind of a run through with uh wobble. Oh, I fucking hated that Rogers kit, that orange Rogers kit. It was horrible. <laughs> I've been I've been pearl pearl drums since '83, but um um uh, so uh, I had a half an hour session with Wobble um, uh, under London Bridge somewhere, and he got on the payphone and just said, Jeanette, he's good. Book the Paris show. And so in the next few months, we did John Peel. Uh, we did Old Grey Whistle Test, live television. I was fucking 19. That's, uh, that's uh, double 19. You were 19. Yeah. Um, and my first show was Paris, Paris au Prontoms, was my right. first gig with the band. Um, I still have both nights. We only released one night. Um, um, and uh, and then by April, we were in US, the US for the first time. 
And, that's, and, and was that was that first U.S. tour? Was that an extensive tour? Well, <laughs> I mean, it was. It was a yeah. five week long tour, but we only did eleven shows. Right. Punk. I don't know. I don't know. Like Keith would say, we're not a band. It's like yeah, if we played thirty nights in a row. Uh, that's how you. That's how you tour America. We yeah. arrived in Boston. We all had suites at the Lennox Hotel for three days before the Boston show. We go to New York at the Gramercy Park Hotel for two or three days before the New York show. It's like we did a show every three or four days. It was ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. Well, I, I like this. I like this photo here that with that you with the forlorn the forlorn look in your face. It looks like it, it's already grinding you down at this yeah. point. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, look at me, 170 pounds. That's uh, amphetamine sulfate for you right there. Yeah, that, that was that was big for you. That was big for you, uh, you guys over there, huh? Yeah, yeah. I used to have um, – uh, there was a doctor on Harley Street who would prescribe me uh, black and whites and um, – so I, I used to carry a prescription um, thinking that would ward off. I think I, I dropped some pills in front of a cop at JFK. Like, what an idiot, you know. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you guys play American Bandstand in 1980? Were you a part of that? Yeah, that's that's in my diary. Um, wow, that's cool. Really, a really amazing black and white photographs from that session. Um, John Brian King has a set of about 15 photographs. Um, he's given me permission to use those in my book. And uh, I still have the screen printed sign from the dressing room door. I wow. mean, uh, yeah, it was absolute chaos. We had, people like to say, and maybe I should agree with them, that we were disassembling the structure of American music, blah, 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 blah. Really, we had no idea what American Bandstand was. Um, well, what, 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 wouldn't it be safe to say that it's sort of like top of the pops? Um, yeah, but we didn't know that. Or, the, or old gray whistle test. You guys did that too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've still got uh, – I've got this. This is a shirt. Wow, you talk talking about guitar picks. What, see that? That's the shirt I wore right there, the Johnny Rotten shirt. That's the shirt I wore on Bandstand and old gray whistle test. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I'm down in my basement over at the office. <laughs> in the basement studio. Yeah. Yeah. So so you you, you have a run with, with public image. Uh, you're in, you're out. You, you come back in. Um, you, you came back in for Flowers of Romance, which is, you know, a, a real uh, incredible record. And you you uh, you produced and co-wrote This Is What You Want, right? You you, you really had a, a, a big hand. At that point, you really sort of had a, a big hand in it, right? Well, I, I think, uh, I mean, really, I had a pretty big hand in Flowers. Flowers of Romance was me, John, and Nick Lorne. Um, and Nick Lorne, that was 10 weeks into Nick Lorne's production career, mm -hmm. Romance. He still produced, he just produced Idols. I mean, he's like producer of the year last year, you know. Wow. He's, he's done nothing but carry on making music. Um, so... I, I would look at flowers as, as a big thing. This is what you want. This is what you get. Yeah. This is not a love song was the biggest selling single for the band still is. Um, but the experimental stuff on flowers, that was the kick-ass stuff. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and, uh, and the, dr the, the, the drums are great. I actually listened, I listened to the whole thing today. Uh, you know, doing, doing, doing my homework. Um, you know, just, about the this is what you want. Uh, it, it that's sort of the infamous record that um, that Keith Levine kind of grabbed the tapes and took took off and released it under right contraband. What was it called? It was called uh, Commercial Zone. Should have been called, should have been called Contraband. <laughs> Sorry. So and and you know God bless Keith. I've had some. He's one of my top three or four favorite guitarists. I mean, I worked with Jordy with Killing Joke, you know, but um, um, <sighs> Keith has had some very well-known problems. Um, and um, he took the tapes from the studio in New York. We recorded at Park South Studios at like 57th and something. Um, 
We spent far too long in there. I have all the tapes. I've got the the cassette copies of 17 rolls of two-inch tape. And um, there are some songs on Commercial Zone, which Keith said, this is my version of the album. And it wasn't. It was just the rough mixes. There's two songs on there that he didn't know they existed until he stole the tape. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, it's tough to listen to that stuff sometimes, you know. Um, and then it's difficult for people to understand that a guitarist might not have had an instrumental role in an album, but yeah. he didn't, thanks to the substances he was involved with, you know. Um, but yeah, that was a fucking mess. It was a complete mess. And um, and then you guys went in and then re-recorded the whole record, right? Yeah. we re Well, first we went to Japan. So just a little bit of history. Please. New York. We're on the we're at the loft. I lived at the, the Iroquois Hotel for six months. Oh, now we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah, when the Iroquois was that was fucking dangerous. Sure, man. Now we're talking. Every day, one of the rooms was taped up at crime. <laughs> <laughs> the, the mad slash the Iroquois. <laughs> oh my god! But uh, so we have a loft at 19th Street and 11th Avenue. It's the building is like one of the only buildings still still the same down there. And um, uh, we booked 12 shows in, in Japan, like 10 nights in Tokyo. Wow. And, um, um, and we were wondering how we're going to do this with Keith because we couldn't do a show in Long Island without having problems with Keith, you know? Drugs, oh. man, dr when, when drugs, when it gets to that point, I, I mean, and, and you're preaching to the converted here. I just dealt with it with the band I'm in. When someone is that deep, Lee, um, in the throes of addiction, it yeah. is. You, you want to talk about a touring band? Forget it, man. Forget yeah. it. Well, so then, not that anybody needs another reason to dislike Paul McCartney, but Paul McCartney's arrested in Japan right. because he's got like a kilo of a reefer. Right. So then, well, like, what an idiot. Then we get word from the promoters in Tokyo. <laughs> was sending you the revised contracts with, it's called the Paul McCartney Clause. Oh, jeez. What is this? And basically, if anybody in the band or the touring party is found to have any stimulants, and that includes VIX inhalers, they class that as a stimulant there. Wow. The tour's off, and we owe the promoters, not the money they were going to pay us, but we owe the promoters the amount of money they think they might have made. Well, so we're like, what the fuck, right? I mean, so we we had a meeting at the loft to talk about how we were going to do this, and it yeah, did, I can I, mean, I can imagine. <laughs> Keith showed up with his lawyer, and I'm like, what? Oh, what? What are we? The fucking Eagles, you know? And um, it went downhill pretty badly. We had to put. Um, we had to put a new band together. Um, you know, somebody said, ooh, this was Martin Atkins' power play. Like, oh, fuck off. I was 22. Yeah. I was on drugs. We had a $100,000 contractual commitment. We were just trying to get through it, you know. So there, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. Is this, is, is this in that ballpark? Oh, that's probably, this is later, this shot, right? This is later. That's at my old studio uh, on Wabash Avenue in Chicago. Okay, yeah. so this is this is quite, quite, quite some time later. So, so the, the the public image thing sort sort of plays out, and you know, um, eventually uh, you leave the band, and then you go on this incredible proficient run. Uh, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the first thing you did out of the gate there was was the damage manual with Ja, right? No, no. Um, actually, the first thing I did, we 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 ended up moving to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. House, swimming pool, palm trees. Mm -hmm. I get a 1954 Ford Crestline. I learn how to drive. Here we go. This is not a love song. It's top four everywhere around the world. I was the most... It took me six months to realize, oh, I know what's wrong. I'm really unhappy. It just didn't occur to me for like six months that with everything that I had, with everything that was happening, we did Miami Vice, which was the biggest TV show. Right, sure, I remember that, yeah. And uh, yeah, Ashley agreed. <laughs> um, uh, 
I'm like, this is shit. I actually quit the music business. Um, I moved to New Jersey, um, uh, got an apartment with my girlfriend at the time, and started working construction. You know? Wow. Fuck this. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, after about eight months, I get a phone call. It's Geordie from Killing Joke. Come and join the band. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. I mean, anybody else other than Killing Joke, I, I might have said no. But I grew up just loving Killing Joke, you know, and the tribal drums that Paul Ferguson did and still does now, you know. And um, uh, just when I was out, they pulled me back in, so to speak, right? So well, then you were, well, 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 you were young. You were young and and full of vitality. So you know, yeah. when you're young, you 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 could you could take it. <laughs> yeah. So so killing joke came after pill. Um, that got me to about 1990. Uh, so I go to London, and killing joke is just a disaster. It's a complete fucking disaster. Um, they're behind with the payments on the equipment storage in the rehearsal room. Um, there's no manager. So I started managing the band. What this one of their guys comes to me, he's like, ah oh, fuck. This is terrible. There's no room in the office. We've got 2,000 flexi discs and there's 400 t-shirts, and there's no fucking money. I'm like, sell me a fucking flexi disc. Come on, man. You know, and, and so what's I, you know, and and um, everywhere I've been in the States. Like the DJs were playing like three or four killing joke cuts. Matt Pinfield with the melody. Yeah, he loved, yeah, he loved he loved killing and joke. Yep. And I'm like, we've got to go to the States. They're like, fuck America. I'm like, no. Eventually yeah. I got Killing Joke to come to the States because I told them about um the Miyako Hotel in San Francisco. I said, Geordie, the baths are this deep. It's a Japanese hotel. You can order sake and sushi on room service. That was it. I'm like, really? That was it for a six-week-long American tour? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and how did Minnesota and, – and then so the Killing Joke – I mean, Killing Joke, and then and then, uh, and then eventually you worked with Ministry and Nine Inch Nails. I mean – So uh, while I was in Killing Joke, um, they were good friends with Al. Of course. Because so, I would spend a lot of time in London, right? So, and is, isn't that a bit of the Chicago connection there too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, well, when I'm in Chicago with Killing Joke, we all end up at Al's loft. Enough said, you know. Um, <laughs> in, in, in what, 1990? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Woo! So, um, so, I'm touring with Killing Joke, and now I become. F f friends-ish with Al. I remember being at the Seagull Hotel in Miami on a payphone in the lobby. Uh, Debbie Harry had asked me to join Blondie. Uh, that happened when I was in New York. We played at the Cat Club. Three nights at the Cat Club. Of course. So I'm like, I was. that was kind of interesting because I grew up listening to Blondie. Sure. But I get a phone call in Miami. It's Al. Would I go out as one of the two drummers uh, on the ministry tour. I'm like, yeah, okay. And um, so that was me and Bill Rieflin. Rest in peace, Bill Rieflin. He just passed earlier this year. So I played on the ministry tour. I saw somebody asked you. I played on the ministry tour while I was still in Killing Joke. That's what I figured, yeah. I have both both years, 1990, yeah. yeah. And then that, that ministry tour was fucking insane. Wow. Um, and... Well, they were hot. They they were kind of hot at that moment, right? That was like they had the they had the music video that was that was on, and that was a hot moment for them, man. Yeah. And, and and which 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 uh, seemingly to me sort of um, it, it which translated to a hot moment for like all the wax a lot of the wax tracks artists, a, 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 right? And it sort of filtered down from from uh, ministry. Yeah, it was an explosion of industrial music. Yes. So. so um, uh, and I think also in there, um, uh, I'd come back to Chicago before the ministry tour because a promoter in Chicago owed Killing Joke five grand. And I'm like, listen, you don't know me, obviously, and you're not familiar with Killing Joke, 
because you're not going to fuck you. This is what are you thinking, man? Because this is going to go on until it's resolved. So at the end of the tour, I flew to Chicago to get our money and, uh, you know, spent some more time with ministry in the studio. And then at the end of that ministry tour, maybe halfway through, all these different people, Ogre from Skinny Puppy, Chris Connolly, uh, 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 KMFDM were opening. Yeah, they were great back then. Yeah, I invited yeah. everybody uh, into the studio the day after the tour ended in Chicago mm -hmm. to work with Steve Albini, and that was the beginning of Pig Face. So ministry ends on one day. The next day I'm in the studio with Pig Face, and I'm still in Killing Joke. Makes sense. Gina says... Amazing ministry show at the Ritz behind the fence. Yeah. I was there. I remember that one. So, oh, uh, oh Paul, Pat, Paul wants to know did you get the 5K? Fucking course I did. <laughs> so, I, I'll tell you the story about that if you want. If you see this, do you see this? Th this metal? Yes, of course. Right. That's, um, that is a hubcap marimba made by test department using pieces of the cage from that tour. I mean, that is like an industrial, I don't know, uh, 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 the provenance. Of <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. And, and I mean, let's touch, let's, let's touch on it here for a second. Uh, for those that may not know, uh, you know, pig face is, 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 is your vehicle 100%. That's, 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 I've had enough of being being a passenger in other people's vehicles. This is my thing in my vision. Tell us a little bit about Pig Face and, and the concept behind it. Well, um, you know, with with PIL, we didn't rehearse. <laughs> it was just like fuck off. I mean, honestly, I mean, it was just unbelievable. The songs fell differently every night. Oh. Some pop tones would be ten minutes long. Sometimes it would be five minutes long. I mean, John's words would hit differently. Uh, they they ironed everything out, unfortunately. But we were a, it was a jam band. Yeah. So, uh, having the two drummer thing in ministry, I'm like, oh, this is. Fun. I want to keep doing this. Right. And um, we just invited a bunch of people to come out. And honestly, how luxurious. To not have anything to prove, right? So um, Paul Raven from Killing Joke came out and played bass. Uh, Flea jumped into the studio with us. Danny Carey from Tool came wow. out in 10 days in 94 in front of the Newcastle Brownell backdrop that I made. Um, it just turns into this crazy thing. Once you start, it, it, it doesn't sound correct for me to say once you start not giving a shit because we really gave a shit. But we, we didn't preconceive of how a show was going to be. So then, all right, uh, Jim Thurwell, join us on stage. And, and Jim would say to me, how does that song go? I'm like, I don't know how it goes with you, Jim. But Genesis P. Orridge came on stage with us in San Francisco and then stayed for the rest of the tour with six cassette machines. Like, what the fuck? And the songs just changed, you know. And once once you start to do that, it, that becomes addictive. Here's 10, 10 guys from the fire station next door in Philadelphia in full regalia playing bagpipes. Here's harp. Here's cello, right? Here's sitar and incense. And it's supposed to be industrial music, but we were really post-punk, you know, motherfuckers. And so that, that just, that maintains to this day. We just toured in 2019. Randy Blythe from Lowry. I mean, touring touring must be quite a quite a uh, quite an offensive to to mount like a military operation when you have. I mean, I remember last time you played in New York, there was at least fifteen people on stage, right? Yeah, the, and there was twenty seven at the Chicago show. Five drum kits: Danny from Tool, Bradley from Chant, Leanne on the kit behind me, but multiple drums set up in front. Our and friend then, Joe, our friend Joe Gauston too played drums with you. Joe Gauston, Andrew Weiss on yep. bass from Ween, along with Charles Levi and Greta Brinkman from Moby. It's just like what the wow. but that becomes addictive and people make sacrifices to do it. You know, 
it's not 27 people on $1,500 a week. You, yeah. it, it's people who are doing it for the love of it and an audience that's just addicted to it. So then people start to come to several shows because it's a different fucking band here than it was there. Yeah. You know, and um, I've been in bands where we play the songs the same. You know, Killing Joke. I mean, I love Killing Joke. But we play the songs. There's a way that love. Well, like things are things are things are rigid. This is the song, yeah. and this is how it goes. And I understand that. With I certainly understand that with Killing Joke for sure. Right, but but when you're on stage with Pig Face, nobody's zoning out, going through the motions. Everybody is fully alert because it's like who's going to do who's going to do what, who's going to invert something that we can all go over there and invert this song and see where it comes out. Wow, that's great. Hey, I need to shout out a couple of sponsors. Uh, let me do that and uh, take care of a couple of things, and we'll be back uh, in a couple minutes, okay? Good deal. Well, there you go. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, and your core hardcore fan page, New York Hardcore Comics. Opened back in 2013 when lifelong friends Debo to Pro and Lee Fairley Combine their collections and obsessions for comic books, punk rock, toys, statues, magic, the gathering, and all things horror. The store is located at 117 Main Street in Dobbs Ferry, New York. If you want to support them during this pandemic, please contact them via email at newyorkharcorecomics at gmail.com. Also, while we're at it, lest we forget the Organic Grill. It's a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 123. 123! First Avenue. Featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News. Their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu could be made gluten-free. For all you gluten-free motherfuckers. This year, they are celebrating their 20th anniversary, and they're all about having a great time and enjoying amazing clean food. After three months of being closed and not open for deliveries, Get in touch with them and order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. That said, I want to mention a couple of upcoming shows real quick. Uh, December 22nd, coming up, we got from Mind Force, Jay Peter. What's up? Love Mind Force. This should be a cool show. Um, Jay Peter, Sunday, November 22nd. After that, on Wednesday, November 25th, one of the old school hardcore thumpers, author and musician Eugene S. Robinson from Oxbow, Whipping Boy, and Blackface. And you better believe we're going to talk about the big Paramount Theater riot in Staten Island. It was the Punks and Skins versus the Guidos in Staten Island. Circa 1981, I was there. It was bananas. So that's, that's, that's on the agenda. Also, uh, psyched on this, um, Sunday, November 29th, you asked for it, you got it. Moby's coming on the show. Uh, Moby with deep hardcore roots, played in the Vatican Commandos and came up playing CBGB's matinees. Uh, lover of New York hardcore, Moby, animal rights activist, that should be cool. And then the very next show after that, pinch me, please. Really excited about this one. I know you are too. From the Sex Pistols and the Wretch Kids, Mr. Glenn Matlock's coming on the show. So that's going to be rich in punk, punk history. So Glenn Matlock, one, one of the nice guys, one of the good guys. So tune in for Glenn Matlock. And all the rest, we'll get to some other ones later on. I want to mention, want to mention, where is New York Hardcore, New York Hardcore Chronicles merch? That's right. You know, the 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 merch link is integrate in, integrated. Yo, it's integrated. It's integrated. Uh up below here, you should be able to see. Uh, if it's there, I can't tell. I believe it is. Um, New York Hardcore merch link. 
I think they're just showing the mug, the 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 New York Harker Chronicles Live mug, and uh, the sweatshirt. But if you go to that link and if you go and look at one of those items and look down, you'll see all the other stuff. Um, we just made some new merch for the holidays. Um, I know it might be hard to see it here, but we just got we just did the do good things a good things come to you line of merch. So there you go. By popular demand, do good things, and good things will come to you. Merch, uh, you see it on there. There's a sweatshirt. There's all there's there's girl shirts. Yo, you girls, who's yo? Seriously, who's thinking about you girls? Who loves you girls? I do. Okay, remember. So go check out the merch. Um, if anybody's down there, um, is the you got your white hoodie yesterday? Good. Cool. Good. Yeah, now you have to buy more. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, all kinds of girl stuff. Somebody, no ugly sweater. No, not, I'm not doing ugly sweaters, man. Dumb shit like that. You know, trying to, trying to keep it, you know. Um, can you, can, if, if somebody out there in the chat room, do, do you see the link underneath, uh, the merch link? Does it show that on the live show? I see it in the, um, I do. That's right. I do. I do. Um, oh yeah, it's below. Thank you. Cool. All right. That, listen, I worked hard <laughs> to hustle up the subscribers. I want to thank everybody for making that happen. The link is down there. If you, if you click the mug or the sweatshirt at the bottom of that, it, it's a little convoluted. You could see everything and the do good things and good things will come to you. Stuff just went up. Let me put the link, the Lancelot link, uh, in the chat room right now. There's, there's the link. What do you think? There's the link. So there you go. New York hardcore merch. Uh, you asked for it. You got it. Uh, also, um, let me get rid of that. Okay. Uh, I want to mention the Patreon. I know you all love when I mention Patreon. Don't be a Patreon. Join Patreon. Our, the Patreon is, it is the community within the community. I mean, everybody likes free, right? Of course, everybody likes free. It's a free world, free music, free everything. You know what? Support this show, will you? Stop lurking. You can't lurk your whole life. Come out from the shadows and support this show. <laughs> so, you know, uh, get down with Patreon. Uh, got a bunch of stuff coming out. Um, for those that can't wrap their head around the Patreon thing, there is a PayPal address. Stone4124 at AOL.com. Please support the show. You don't have to lurk your whole life. You can come and be a part of our community. So, so there you go. Uh, Baltimore Steel. Yes, you can, brother. Yes, you can. Uh, you haven't worn your socks yet. Yo, uh, send me a picture of the socks upstate, Rick. You know? Yes, Lori Dawn. Number one merchandise model. You need that to you need that long sleeve tape. So, you know, come on in. The water's fine. So that's that. Um, I want to shout out. I want to shout out my, my latest Patreon patrons. Um, Christopher Hoffman, Riz Faruqi, uh, John Siciliano, Scott Adler. Thank you, bro. Scott Adler jumped in the pool. Thomas Rudy, Victor Mogliansky. Love that. Love that name. Victor Mogliansky. Who do you think I am, B? Victor Molianski. Anything with ski on the end, right? Robert Meyerson and John Berneas. Berneas. Our man, John Berneas from out in Long Island. Thank you, bro. I, I appreciate that. Um, what else? Uh, listen, the Patreon thing, we're heading out to do the Drew Stone Cinematic Music and Walking Tour. That's going out in a couple weeks. Um, you know, at, a, at, at, the, at one of the upper tiers. 96 tiers. There's uh, New York Hardcore Chronicles 10 questions starring you. So I think I covered a lot here. Uh, sorry to ramble on. Ramble on. Uh, don't lurk. Don't lurk. Hey, Susan. How you feeling, Susan? I hope you're well. Haven't seen you in a minute. Um, Rudy can't fail. Ski. Is that, to, is, that, is, that, <laughs> is that today's joke? Ski. Yo, Ski, like Flan on the last show. 
today's like Frank Zappa used to do on a show. Today's uh, tonight's uh, t- tonight's secret word is ski. All right. There you go. Brewski. Yoski. Um, that said, I think I covered the lot here. Uh, you know, yo, one last picture. Yo, it's Veterans Day, all right? Because it's Veterans Day, one last picture of my dad in my dad in the army, all right? One last picture of Arnie Stone in the army, okay? Just so you just so you know, it's not all serious in the armed forces. Here's my dad uh, during the Korean War conflict with one of his buddies from the Bronx uh, living it up in the barracks. So there you go. Um, I want to thank all the veterans out there uh, for your service. Freedom does not come free. Every, you know something? Let me address this a second. You know, everybody likes to go out and throw a brick once in a while. I get it. I get it. But freedom doesn't come free. You're lucky you're able to go out in this country and throw a brick. So there you go. There you go. Oh, it's oh, is that right? Is it Independent Day in Poland? Is that right? I did not know that. Happy Independent Day in Poland to all our Polish brothers and sisters. Um, pig face, pig face ski. Good one. All right. That said, um, I think we're good. I think we're set. I feel good about this. Let's bring on our guest, Mr. Martin Atkins. Hey, man. Hey. Sorry, sorry about all that ranting and raving. No, it, uh, it, this Patreon thing is interesting. You know, I did a Kickstarter for uh-huh. my uh, for my third book, Band Smart. And um, if anybody wants that, by the way, they can go to martinatkins.com and they get a free download of all 600 pages of that. Um, but uh, we did a pledge campaign for mm-hmm. my about PIL, we were fully funded at sixteen thousand dollars, and then pledge music went. Um, which oh, really, why, why why did why did that happen with pledge music? Um, well, the, the, something that happens when a creative enterprise gets involved with something that has stocks involved in it. Right. So people start thinking about the share price, and. Um, Things started to get a little bit strange. Things started to feel like 1985 music business checks in the mail bullshit. Ugh. And uh, I was in Japan. I did a couple of things in Tokyo to 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 do these events. I was over in the UK. I'm like, yeah, we just need to get that money from all of our pledges so we can start all of the scanning and the layout. And uh, that went on for like seven months. It really messed everything up. And then I think they declared bankruptcy and somebody might go to jail. I'm, I'm not really. Oh, geez. One of those, one of those deals, huh? Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's. It's pickable music business shit. The Patreon thing has been a real blessing for me. Uh, you know, people love the show and, and I need support. I need, I need help to do it. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, um, you know, people know my work and know what I've done and, and know just, you know, the love that I have, um, you know, for for um, music history. You know, I'm a music historian and uh, people got behind it. And I'm very, I'm very fortunate uh, that the show is uh, caught the wind, so to speak. And but but, you know, and, and, and you're the you're the right guy to talk to this about, you know, um, you know, it's interesting because the show's at the point now where I've been approached about going into a studio and doing it, you know, with, 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 with one sponsor and that type of thing. And, you know, it's, that's, that's such a chasm to, to jump. And, you know, I have such a, a, um, a, a loving fan base here. You know, it, it, it's sort of, it's sort of a dilemma. Uh, your thoughts on, 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 I mean, you've been there many times. I, I don't think it's a dilemma uh, at all, Drew. It's like, it, you know, any of us who have waited for somebody to give us permission to do something, you know, um, I don't like that. Momentum is key. Relationships are key. And if you've got, if you've got a bunch of people helping you already, then just keep building on that, you know. And um, uh, it's great to have support until that support is taken away for 
the reasons of a stock price dropping. Yeah. Or somebody right. leaves and the new person doesn't like you, your music, what, yeah. whatever it is. And it's just like I would much rather be um, my own paycheck, you know, than um, than uh, than rely on somebody else. Well, that's where it's at now. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, it, it's nice, it's flattering to get an offer like that, but, but there is an inherent charm to do, to doing it, in, in, you know, in, in, you know, or when I'm in Florida in my dad's kitchen, you know, but. But, but I, I think that, you know, that's, that's part of the inherent charm of it. And, and for, for, yeah. And, and yes, hardcore is a DIY sub Yep. But, right. uh, but and, you know, I mean, the, the best way to get a record deal is to not need one. Yeah. You know? Right. You can at least go, all right, look, if you give me these three things, I might consider it, but I'm sitting here with a, you know, I'm Melissa Etheridge with my thousand subscribers a month. Fuck off. You know, and uh, the independence is a good thing. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And and it's interesting because in, in sort of the, the 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 chaotic music world that we live in, it, live in, sometimes I think some of us do long for the old days when there was an infrastructure, uh, you know, to, to record companies where you have a budget to go in to do a record, you get a budget, you you get a little tour support. So you know, th there was there was some sort of an infrastructure. It, it, it's hard for some. It's hard for some to navigate without it. Yeah, uh, uh, but somebody. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they said, "You know what? It seems to be all the old guys who yeah. are thriving right now." Yeah. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I'm like, well, that's easy. You know, I'm 61. I remember when drum machines came out in like I don't know 75. And people, you know, bass players and guitarists love fucking with drummers. And they call it, <laughs> that's it for you, Martin. There's a machine now. And, of course, you listen to the first drum machine. Boop, 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 boop. It's just yeah, yeah. But, but drum machines replaced shitty, shitty drummers. But so that's like, and then we start our own labels. And then we're, we're using recording tape. And we're, we're sending off masters to disc makers. Well, I did in the in 85, 86, to have a vinyl record made. And then it's like CDs, and then it's iTunes, then it's streaming, and now vinyl's back, and we're teaching ourselves to do all this stuff. We're on the road. We're dealing with a different nightmare every day. Looks like the venue's been broken into and, and a bomb. <laughs> and it's like, no, they just haven't tidied up yet. And the sound system doesn't work. <laughs> the toilet doesn't work. And you make it work. And so that's what we do. It's like, everything's terrible. What are we going to do? We'll do something. I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but we're going to fucking do something. Absolutely. And Let, let's talk a little bit about um, the two books you wrote, um, Tour Smart and Break the Band, and Band Smart Succeed in the Music Business on Your Own. I... I I love I love the tour the tour smart book and and I guess you know just from being out there and just seeing just seeing the the atro just witnessing the atrocities out there after you know I assume just um, you know compelled you to write the book tell us a little bit about uh, about that well I, I started and I got band smart here actually I started um, I wrote tour smart incrementally by accident this is band smart. For those of us who remember a phone book, it's a fucking phone book. It's, it's the it's the bookend to, to Tussmark. Um, I started teaching at Columbia College, Chicago, and um, and there wasn't a book. There wasn't a book. They had a book that the students had purchased for like sixty dollars a piece, and um, uh, it was like theatrical touring in the sixties. I'm like, we can't. I can't use this book. So I started to write Tour Smart over the course of a year. And then um, somebody wanted me to take all the F-bombs out. I'm like, there's 166 F-bombs in there. <laughs> and I'm like, well, then leave the music business. If that's a problem, you know, it's easy to solve. I'm not taking any F-bombs out. You should take yourself out of the music business. Um, and, and I thought that teaching 
was kind of an interesting opportunity. But the, it turned out the opportunity from teaching was my first book. And I've been all over the world playing my drums. I've been more places speaking because of my books. You know, South America, I've been to Norway five times. Um, you know, I, 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 there's another book, I, which I, I don't know if you know about, Welcome to the Music Business, You're Fucked. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know this one. It's, it's a kind of a, it's a light read with lots of pictures. It says fucks on every single page. <laughs> and as, as good as that book is, the T-shirt is spectacular. It really is. I'll, 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 I'll send you a shirt and a book. And, and how, how, did you, how did you arrive? I mean, you're the music business program co uh, coordinator at Millican University, right? Yeah. How did, you, how did that happen? Well, um, so I, I spent uh, a few years at Columbia, uh, just teaching. Columbia, on, Columbia out there. Columbia College, Chicago. Yeah. In Chicago, right, right. Um, then I started, that's me to go up to Madison, Wisconsin, to teach at a, um, a small place called Madison Media Institute. Mm -hmm. They actually helped me. I left school when I was 16, you know. Um, so, and people would say to me, what's your master's degree? And I'm like, I don't have a, okay. Rock and roll, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's your bachelor's degree? And I'm like, I don't have one. Okay, well, what is your associate's degree? I'm like, I don't have one. But Madison Media Institute helped me get my associates in audio and my bachelor's in entertainment media business. And then um, I got involved with a school called SAE. There's one in Chelsea, uh, New York City, a uh, small school. Um, and there's 57 of them around the world. So I've been to a bunch, you know, uh, and I started to write that program, the whole curriculum for the program. And, um, and then I started to hear about Millican University. It's two hours south of Chicago. Um, the city of Decatur itself is a little bit, um, needs some help, I think. Um, it's a challenge. I, I am not familiar with Decatur. I have not been there. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've seen some problematic um, parts of the country. And I think uh, the equation with Decatur is very easy to fix. And I think the university is working hard to do that. Um, I mean, I know Madison. I mean, Madison yeah. is Madison. <laughs> Madison's gorgeous. Um, yeah. The campus at Millican is amazing. They just put in a $25 million commons building, a new uh, musical theater building. I mean, it really is uh, uh, a, a really uh, uh, relaxing, inspiring campus to be on. It's one of the reasons we do Midwest Music Expo is to, to have people come to the campus and see it. Um, so for the last three years, I've been uh, coordinating that program, changing things around, making it work for students who need to get out into the job market when they graduate. Um, and everything that we're doing is geared towards that, you know. You mentioned uh, the Midwest Music Expo. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I'd like to bring on a friend of ours. Uh, um, tell us what's coming up this week. Well, um, Saturday is our all day -er, um, with panels. Um, uh, Wendy Day, who was credited with getting Eminem signed, she did mm -hmm. the biggest hip hop deal in history, the Cash Money deal. Yep. She's going to do a panel. Trey Elder from a label called Quiet Pterodactyl, what a mouthful that is, uh, is going to talk to us about a compilation he put together with Twilight Tone of the Gorillas and Jeff Tweedy from Wilco. Uh, Add to a rapper mentor from the south side of Chicago. Uh, Common is his uh, mentor. He's going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to look at alternative touring with Shannon Curtis, who wrote the book about alternative touring. Um, Eddie Sanders, who's an attorney here in Chicago. Uh, there's a recording panel with Kevin Garneri, who worked with, uh, I've forgotten who we worked with. He worked with somebody huge, not Melissa Etheridge, but somebody like that. I don't know. And, um, What's the, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking, go but, on, go on. It's, it is the first scratch and sniff. Nice. 
scratch and sniff conference in the world. So we've been frantically printing these. Um, <laughs> commemorative uh, collector's edition signed and numbered. Wow, that's all, that is awesome. And you're sending them out and you, you're getting addresses and sending them out to everyone? Yeah. And there is, is, there's some locations awesome. in Decatur um, that have them. But was it Cheryl Crow? No. Was it Mariah Carey? It was Mariah Carey. He worked with Mariah Carey for 10 years. He's on our recording panel. Oh, Molly. Figures it's Molly. Yeah. Thanks, Molly. All right, go, go ahead. Uh, Kevin works in the audio. He runs the studio, um, beautiful Neve studio. Sure. At, at, at the Millican campus. Haven't so, heard that in a second. A Neve board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A uh, Neve board. So wow. what I'm trying to do, this is, of course, homage to John Waters in the movie Polyester. Um, mm -hmm. And so the idea is, as, as disconnected as we all are, um, we're going to, you know, scratch a panel, scratch one of these numbers before a panel or during a story and and find a way to differently connect with smells. And, and the olfactory system, smells are the deepest, hardest, most permanent way for people to connect with, with their memories. So um, maybe the idea is that any time you, you smell uh, um, fresh cut grass, or vanilla, or coffee, you'll order one of my books or sign up for a new. Hey, uh, my a lot of the people is asking about the scratch and sniff stuff. You better make your move because the 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 festival's going on this week. So yeah, it's oh, it's tight. If somebody's desperate for one and wants to drop some FedEx action, we can yeah. get some cards to you. Um, because uh, it, it's it's a really cool thing. It's crazily complicated, um, as most cool things are. But it's what I'm trying to do is show kids on the south side of Chicago or anybody who's like, everything is fucked. We can't do anything. Well, you can fucking do that, right? You know, you can do things. And creativity is the pathway. Yep, abs absolutely. Um, and we have uh, we have a screening tomorrow, right? Well, and we are we are screening. Let's let's let me clear the deck here a little bit. And, well, I, and I I would neglected to mention our guest of honor on Saturday, which uh, and this also ties in with tomorrow's screening. Michael Anthony Alago, uh, who I crossed paths with uh, in '84 when I was working with Public Image Limited, and Michael was at Electra. Um, I'm going to be talking with Michael on Saturday, which I'm really looking forward to. And we are screening uh, the documentary you made, uh, Who the Fuck Is That Guy, tomorrow evening at 7. And that's free. To, all of this stuff is free for people to attend um, and ask questions and, and uh, uh, immerse themselves in all of this craziness. Absolutely. And anybody out there, please, it's a scree it's, it's a, it's a scree freening. It's a free screening. Uh, go to uh, um, MidwestMusicExpo.com. All you got to do is just sign up for it. You can be a part of it. Even if you've seen, even if you've seen the film a couple of times, come in towards the end. Be a part of the Q and A. What's important is that we're all part of this music community. So please check it out. That said, let's bring on our good friend and subject of the film I made, Michael Alago. What's happening? Hello, hey, Michael. Morning, darling. How are you? This shit smells funky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you and, got and, one. I, yes, I'll, uh, I have two, so I'll give you one, Drew, because we're in the city together. Okay, good. And Martin yeah. didn't even get me the locker room smell that I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> there was no jock strap. There was no smelly pits. <laughs> but it still smells bloody awful. So there was, I'll, no, locker, I'll find, there was I'll, no locker room. There was hello. no leather. There, there was. <laughs> I can't believe it, but I guess I'll talk about um, something else that we discussed, so we'll surprise everybody. And uh, it's very nice to see you, Martin. It's nice to see you too, Michael. Yes, it's been a very long time. And, yeah. and, and we're excited, Alago. You know, um, our film, you know, is is, is uh, we haven't done a screening in a little while. I know. And, uh, you know, just, you know, people out there might have asked lately, 
uh, we actually, the, the film, if a couple of people noticed it's not on Netflix right now. It's not on Amazon Prime. What has happened incredibly is that we have we got the property back. Now, this is very rare in this business, as, as a lot of us know. It's like getting your record back. We, we got our film back. It did a glorious run on Netflix and Amazon Prime and did a lot of great three stuff. Yep, three years. And miraculously, at this point, we have the property back. We're figuring out what we're going to do. We got a couple of offers. It's because there's a like, you know, Martin, you can attest to this. There's so many new platforms for, for films and for music. And, you know, so that's what we're looking at. So as of right now, this is really the only way you could see the film. So tune in. To, so tune in tomorrow and see the film for free. You know, and it's it's uh, it's great for students. So yeah. students are interested in students who are want to get in the music business. You know, maybe we want to say, well, maybe you don't. <laughs> you yeah, right, right. But but they can they can see this uh, path. There are students who are interested in filmmaking um, and, and all of it, you know, and there are students who are interested in putting on events. So it, it just, it, it works pretty well for, uh, for everyone. And I'm, I'm excited about it. Absolutely. It, it, it should be a lot of fun tomorrow. And, and uh, always love doing, always love doing Q and A's with the Lago. Yes. After the film. Who is this here? Lori Dawn Ceramics. Michael is happiness personified. That's right. Hey, hey Laurie, how are you? Nice to see you. You know, Martin, it really is. Drew and I are so excited that we got the rights to our film back because, you know, like he said earlier, people spend their whole lives hoping that they get their masters back. You know, just maybe three years ago, Metallica got the rights to their albums back from Electra Records 25 <laughs> years later. And so that was a, that was a pretty landmark loss. That was a pretty landmark. I think I think that was known as the Eagles clause or something. Really? They, 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 I, th I think so. They actually they fought and they got all their stuff back. I think it was 25 years, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But I think what happens at Drew, I think at 25 years is that it, it automatically reverts <laughs> back to the artist. Yes. Yeah, but let me just say, but you have to aggressively go after it. That's it correct. It doesn't magically happen. And suffer. Um, but you <laughs> know, spend when, money on a lawyer. When they, when they knew that they got these masters back, the first thing they did was they remastered Kill 'em All, Ride the Lightning, and Master of Puppets. They put a booklet together, they made a box set, and they made an event out of it so that people wanted to go back and hear. What the hell's going on? This record sounds better than ever. Wow, there's an 80-page booklet attached to it. So, you know, we're looking to hopefully do some new launching with our film in the new year. Maybe yeah. a little sooner. Let me, let, me, let me address this that Sid the Kid said. Well, Metallica has the money to fight that in court, though. Yes, that's true. But by doing that initial fight, they opened the door and set the precedent for a lot of others. Sure. Absolutely. Is that is that the copyright reversion clause, or yeah. is it master? Ma, is no, it master no, I think it's a master's. I think it's a master's uh, thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. maybe Keith Levine will get the rights back to the album he stole in the first place. <laughs> oh, no. well, you know, you never know in the, in this day and age. What what la didn't what label put that out at the time? Didn't someone put that out actually? Yeah, but it was. It was impounded at Bonaparte Distribution on Crosby Street. Oh, right, because we all used to hang out over there. Like mm -hmm. the space was so cheap, <laughs> and um, uh, I remember seeing a huge pile of about fifteen thousand copies with tape all over it, like impound tape, um, because they weren't allowed to sell it. Uh, but I think they might have. But wait, Martin, which record are you talking about? Commercial Zone. Oh, Commercial Zone, right. It's, it, that's the one that uh, it was the it, pill record that Keith Levine grabbed the masters. And, that's right. You, you okay. know, it's kind of, I mean, not to get in, not, not, to, not to really get into it, but, but it's sort of mind boggling to me that, that was it that easy that he grabs the master tapes and he has the authority to put it out and they just put it out? <sighs> How did that happen? You have to remember. God bless Keith Levine. I mean, I think he, he believed much of what came out of his mouth. Right. You know, 
That and, helps. That helps. <laughs> and I think then that a lot of people uh, thought he was telling the truth. You know, people will say to me yeah. now, so when Keith created the Flowers of Romance album, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I used to know which room Keith had fallen asleep in for half a day because of the pattern of the carpet where he nodded out on the floor, and, you know, imprinted into the side of his face. But I mean, you know, we're, we all, uh, we're all delusional to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, and I think people believe Keith and, uh, you know, I, I remember when I went, my, my attorney, I don't know if you know an attorney from way back in New York called Michael Turok. Um, he, he represented Mary Wales in the human puppy ministry. Okay. Now, he, he went to tidy up my publishing uh, from Public Image. And uh, he's on the phone. I was in his office and somebody, somebody from CBS Music is on the phone. Why is Martin, why are you trying to do a deal for Martin Atkins' share of these songs that Keith Levine wrote in their entirety? <laughs> it's like, wow. no, he didn't. Yeah, I mean, as I said, God bless him. I had a wonderful three-hour phone conversation with him uh, about eight months ago. It's the longest we've ever spoken. And um, at one point, he was he started to have a go at me because that was his game. That was always his game. Um, and and I think I said to him, like, Keith, I was 22. And he said, Martin, I was 23. And, like, everything just stopped, you know. It's we're incredible. Like, Shit, we were just you know, idiots. You know? Absolutely. So in, the, so in the end, was it a decent conversation with him? With it, Keith? it was a decent conversation, but... Um, what was the point of the conversation? Well, I've, I've started to put a book together about my five years in and out and in and out and in and out of pill. Oh, and, great. And so I've spoken to... Um, Spoken to a bunch of people. I should speak to you too. Uh, sure. Mike. Oh absolutely. yeah, you should. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Bruce Butler from Virgin Australia, who stayed up for days and greeted us off the plane in Australia. And John walks down the steps. Fuck you. Eat shit and die, you bastard. <laughs> okay, great. You know. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but I, I thought I should talk to. Um, to everybody, uh, I spoke to everybody except John, whose manager asked for um, what do you call it? a look through, and I and I said, of course, we we want to get the interview correct between myself and John, and I understand that. And he said, no, we need a a, a look through the entire book. I'm like, well, I'm not I'm not going to let you do that. Mm -hmm. And th thanks, I guess we you know. Yeah, so I, I, I talked to I tried to talk to everybody. So that's the reason for your most recent uh, conversation with Keith was for yeah. the bill book. Well, I would um I would love to uh, speak to you about it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the, the the let me just uh, reiterate that the screening of who the fuck is that guy, the fabulous journey of Michael Alago, uh, is tomorrow. That's seven o'clock um, Central Time. That's eight o'clock eight p.m. our time. Uh, the film runs for 75 minutes, and then there's a Q&A after. Please, everybody out there, sign up. It, it's free. Uh, Alago, I want to yes. thank you for stopping by. Oh, thank you, Martin. It's so great to see you. It's now, I'm going to see you today. I'm going to see you tomorrow, and I'm going to see you on Saturday. Wow. I'll, I'll be, the, there'll be a buzz at the door. It's me, Martin. Let me in. <laughs> and I oh, am, I oh, here, oh, yeah. Here you I'm, go. Well, I can't let you draw. I can't let y'all get away without me letting everybody know. Besides the movie that you made about me, who the fuck is that guy, people? There is a book out called I Am, oh, I am Michael Alago, Breathing Music, Signing Metallica, Beating Death, 20 bucks on Amazon. Please go pick it up. It's filled with great stories. Martin, Drew, I'll see ya. Thank you for having me. I love you. Me. I'll talk to you soon. Big love. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Bye. bye. <laughs> well, I got, I, I got to say... Um, how fortunate to uh, for any of us to still be around yeah. and to talk to each other. I mean, what I'm looking forward to is the screening tomorrow. Um, 
the Q&A, the opportunity for students to say, uh, somebody asked me yesterday, how did, how did, which school did Michael Olago go to? I, I said, I, I think he went to a place called the Ritz in New York. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> he went to the school of Max's Kansas City. Yeah. And um, there's so many opportunities to, for him to talk to a student, to, to inspire somebody as they begin their path. And, and so how luxurious to, for me, 61 and however old Michael is, to sit and and, uh, and talk with you too, Drew, about like, have we come to any conclusions about any of this? Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, so hey, let me let me do my last shout out to the sponsors and and we'll be back in a couple minutes and we'll take some questions, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. You ask for what you got it. Clock, socks, bagels, and locks. Men's wear, silverware, ladies wear underwear, clank your chains, and count your change. Sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, and The Texas Silver Rush. Your core. Fan page is a digital platform aimed at capturing hardcore punk bands in real time and get up-to-the-date information on what they're doing now. Also, the page is focused on promoting and supporting bands, the venues, and merchandise through the Instagram app on your core fan page. So please support Chris and your core fan page. Also, want to shout out Warren and our friends at Pitchfork and, of course, Zum at Fryette. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Lest we forget. Want to – let me clear the deck here. Coming up. Coming up on – Sunday, December 6th, bringing in the heavy guns, the big boys. It's Mike Judge from Youth of Today, Death Before Dishonor, Dishonor and Judge. Come on now. This is going to be a good one. Actually, they're all going to be good ones, you know. Um, that said, um, also, after, after the, the Mike Judge show, just announced this the other day. On Sunday, December 13th, we have Gary Meskill from Propane and the Crumb, the Crumb Suckers. There you go. How about that? Talk to Gary about 1985 and, and the, the early crossover days and the Seabees matinees and all that cool Crumb Sucker stuff. Um, you know, big, big influence on a lot of bands, the Crumb Suckers. You know, I should, you know, I should reach out to Kirk Hammett and ask him to come on for a minute. And so he loves the crumb suckers, you know. Um, and then last but not least, and yeah, there's other shows I haven't even announced yet. We're booked for the next two months. Uh, the, how about the Global Unity Show with our guys from Beijing and from Hong Kong with Lee and Riz from Unregenerate Blood and King Lai Chi. Um, we're going to talk to our brothers in China. So that's that is good stuff. Don't be scared. That is good stuff. Also, I uh, want to mention one more time. Uh, oh, if you're watching in, in a rerun, rerun, hunchback, rerun, um, please subscribe to the show. There's a button right there, right there. There's a button. Please subscribe to the Stone Films NYC uh, YouTube channel so you know when the shows are happening uh and also if you have one of these if you have one of these devices if you have a communication device here as you are marooned and stranded on this planet please follow me on instagram at stone films nyc okay stone films nyc it's not rocket science. Follow me on Instagram. That's where you get the latest on what is happening left and right. Um, what a mess when Hammett showed up at CBGB's during the Crumb Sucker set. Yeah, that's sort of history. Yeah, man, how about that, Ack? What's happening down in Florida, Ack? Tallahassee, brother. Uh, the mighty King Lee Ch Lai Chi. Yep, coming down to Florida in a couple days. Um, you should ask Tommy Carroll to come on and ask why he spit on Kirk. You know, 
embarrassing. Like, who do you want to talk about that? You know, it's like, it's like, ugh. Embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for the New York hardcore scene that that somebody that loves New York hardcore comes to a matinee and gets on stage and gets spit on. Hey, everybody was young. Everybody was young, you know, back then. You know, so you know, there's there's that. Yes, yes, Larry Kelly. It is rocket. It's rocket surgery. Um, want to post up again the um, link to the merchandise merch link. Yo, merch link. Uh, the merch is also, it's now integrated, yo. You could see it right underneath there. But if you're wondering, yo, how could I get that? Do good things and good things come to you. Uh, doggy hoodie or whatever. Or the New York hardcore shower curtain, curtain. Or the New York hardcore mug. It's right there. Don't be shy. Support the show. Support the show on Patreon also. This is important stuff. There it is. Whoop, there it is. Patreon, support the show. Don't be shy. Don't forever lurk. In, 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 thank you. Good one. It's integrated ski. All right, ski? It's integrated ski. Um, there you go. Now, that said, let's get some questions from Martin Atkins. I know you guys have been posting them up the whole show. Please repost. I can't go back and find them. So... Uh, please repost a question from Martin Atkins. And uh, let me get rid of uh, my Instagram thing. Thing. Hey, yo, you got that thing? Yo, that thing. You got that thing? Um, let me get rid of that thing. That's gone. Integrated. I know. I got to make a zombie apocalypse shirt. Um, yep. All right. Questions from Martin. Let's see. Let's go, you rocket scientists. Um, okay, hold on. Chucky Brown, you out there? Where's the, Okay, here we go. Let's start with the human falafel. Hey, Martin, how you doing, man? Uh, the yeah. human falafel asks, is there going to be a new pig face LP? Um, there is a double live red vinyl album from the last tour in a hand-screened, uh, gatefold, signed and numbered sleeve. Nice. Uh, the deluxe version has got this amazing insert signed by everybody. Wow. Yeah, it's insane. Um, so that's next. And then we're, we're just starting to reissue some of the early 90s stuff on vinyl, remastered, bonus tracks, that kind of thing. Um, will there be new music? Um the next thing I want to do creatively, I've got to finish my PIL book. My memorabilia is ridiculous. Nice. Um, and um, my photographs, I had my 35 millimeter camera in the studio all the time. Um, so that, books next, and then maybe some music in a while. Yeah. Cool. Our friend Oleg asks, Martin, could you speak a bit about the RX project? Yeah, so um, uh, Ogre from Skinny Puppy um, has something called Ogre, O-H-G-R. Uh, but we had Ritalin, Rx, um, a couple of years before that. And I worked with Ogre um, in Pigface, of course. He's on the first album. He was on the ministry tour that we talked about. And I actually, Rick Rubin brought me in, uh, Mark Geiger brought me into American Recordings to produce a skinny puppy album called The Process um, because uh, I was able to work with Ogre to get really good results on uh, on his vocals. Um, so uh, it seemed kind of a natural thing to do a solo album with him and that's what the Ritalin project was. And it was, it was kind of stunning uh, for me because uh, I like... Well, Dwayne from Skinny Puppy isn't around anymore, but I really like those guys. I get on really well with Kevin. But Skinny Puppy is not a musical project for Ogre to experiment with. He's the singer in Skinny Puppy. Yeah. He walked into my studio with an acoustic guitar, and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was just going to go, la, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> and he played uh, um, Scarecrow by Sid Barrett. I'm like, what the fuck? It was like a magic trick. And um, uh, so we kind of explored this other side of Ogre. Um, 
And that, that was a really great, interesting, creative time for me. I really loved that album. You know, here's a photo that I didn't post, and I love it. I want to put it up. This one here. Uh, yeah. yeah. This. Want to tell us what this is? Or do you remember when this was? I remember exactly when that was. That's. Uh, I still have that shirt. Um, that's on the roof of the Townhouse Recording Studio in Goldhawk Road, London. Um, that's where we recorded um, Flowers of Romance. That's where I recorded the drums for the Extremities, Dirt, and various Repressed Emotions album with, with uh, Killing Joke. Uh, that's where Phil Collins recorded In the Air Tonight. Um, and that's, um, yeah, that's got to be 90, 89, 90 maybe. And the wonderful Paul Raven, uh, sadly no longer with us, uh, next to me there in the Fuck the Police t-shirt. And, you know, uh, I used to tell everybody all the time, Raven was a fucking pirate. You know, the, uh, yeah, 89, 90, Martin, yeah. Um, when Raven came back into Killing Joke, there was, a, there was another bass player called Dave Tafe Ball was playing bass when I joined. And everybody would sit around and have cups of tea during rehearsals. And uh, it was always to, uh, Raven this and Raven that. Absolutely mythological fucking <laughs> and um and I, oh he's coming back like Jordy I love playing with Jordy and you know I would just go fucking crazy I mean I was 30 pounds lighter I mean 25 years, however many years ago I mean we were really on top of our game and uh Raven arrives in London I'm like well where is he? Somebody's on the phone He's at a pub. He's holding the landlord at bay with a chair. Oh, jeez. Whilst giving people free drinks. While the pub, you know, <laughs> and he's run up a two and a half thousand pound bar bill. <laughs> and he jumps over the bar and starts dancing on the bar owner's BMW. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, yeah, here we go. I mean, it was just chaos from the get go. And, um, I loved working with him in Killing Joke. Um, uh, when I left Killing Joke, he came with me into Pig Face. Um, he was involved with Murder Inc. as well as with Jordy and Paul Ferguson, the original Killing Joke drummer. Yeah, that was crazy. Were the shows really as legendary as they seemed from the crowd? Specifically, the Cleveland shows in the early Pig Face days, downing full bottles of whiskey while drumming, etc. Ooh. No, I, I I didn't do that. Um, you know, I had I had 16 years sober. Uh, yeah. Something I'm sure I'll get into uh, with Michael. Michael's been really nice. Um, I I had 16 years sober. Then my dad died, and I said, "Fuck it," started drinking again. But um, I, I'm sure members of the band would down full bottles of whiskey. Um, I, I know at one point uh, I had 12 people on a bus. They were doing so much potent acid. Oh, the only thing I could think to do was at like four o'clock every day. I would get on the bus and go. Time to drop. We should have had a T-shirt because I just tried to synchronize everybody together so that at least people weren't up and down at different times. You know, oh, man, that's a, that's that's a lot, man. Um, let me see what else we got here. Uh, let's see. I've got a story your your listeners might like, but you got it's 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 five or six minutes long if you want it. I think you'll like it, but I can't. Yeah, we, we only got about ten minutes. Uh, if you could, if you could, you know. Oh, no. let's see what let's see what else we got. We got a couple of questions. Oh, I'm, um, I'm happy answering questions. Um. Let's do Chucky Brown. It's Chucky Brown's question of the day. Chucky Brown from Crazy Eddie. Chucky asks, let me see. Um, this one's a little confusing. Uh, can he speak on a dare with bassist Pete Jones that turned into a fight with Gigi Allen while on tour in Boston with Brian Brain in 81? Did you guys get into a scrap with that lunatic? So let me tell you. Oh, God. 
1981 or two, um, 81, uh, I was, I had my band Brian Brain at the same time as Pill. And we were just fucking lunatics. Um, our rider was three cases of beer, a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of brandy, a bottle of vodka, and there were three of us in the band. There was fucking three of us. So uh, I was bottled in the face uh, at the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. Oh. Uh, uh, 16 stitches, eight subcutaneous stitches. Uh, you can still see that there, right? Um, uh, and these were like old stitches, like fucking Frankenstein stitches going up the, uh, the there. You can oh. see. And this is from sitting behind. You're sitting in the sitting in yeah. drumming. No, Brian Brain. My drums are on reel to reel tape. Ah. And I'm singing. That show had to stop, not because I was bottled in the face and Pete had some glass in his eyes, but every microphone in the place was full of blood. Oh. So we go to New Orleans on St. Patrick's Day. Um, I took the dressing off my face because we're on the steamship Natchez on the Mississippi drinking green beer. And I thought my this wound would upset the tourists, which it did. But then something happened. I, so I'm in New Orleans General. Wherever, wherever, wherever we end up at the Mabuhay Gardens in San Francisco. Oh, now we're talking. Two shows the same day. And uh, my first time in a mosh pit was our second show where I, two sold out shows, I was unconscious from alcohol. Uh, uh, they passed me over the crowd in the mosh pit to get into the ambulance. I spend the night in hospital. We get to Boston. This is 21 days. We get to Boston. We had our show. And we had one night before jumping on a plane going back to England. And we go to the Rathskeller. And uh, we're sitting around the table. A bunch of uh, girls, fans were hanging out. We've done the tour. I'm, you know, whatever. This band comes on. Fuck you. I'm going to fuck your sister. Fuck, 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 fuck you. Fuck, fuck you. Oh, what the fuck is going on here? Pete Jones says to me, I'll buy you a white Russian if you'll fucking take care of this guy. Oh, ho. And this is where we see the beginnings of my negotiating skills, my entrepreneurial skills. I said to Pete Jones, make it two. <laughs> so I, I, I down two white Russians and uh, I jump up, push the, stinger, push the stinger onto the dance floor, knock over the mic, unplug the bass, knock over a couple of cymbals, unplug the guitar, pick up a monitor. Yeah. And this is and this is at the Rat in Boston, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a scar on my head about this from from, from a Gang Green show uh, in 1981. Slammed as a, they had a they had a, a brick pillar, a brick in the middle, and I went I was mad thrashing on the floor and went head first into it and and, and split my split my my scalp at the wow. Rat in Boston, the infamous Rat. Let's go. So I pick up a monitor, throw that on the singer, and then. Even in that state, I'm like, I kind of overdid it. So I stand there on stage waiting for the band to jump on me, for the audience to jump on me, and people just start applauding. The band are kind of frightened. People are just applauding. People start sending me drinks, and for the next two hours, I'm living like a king. I go in the bathroom to have a piss. Yep. Both hands are, are on my what's it. Here it goes. Uh, boom. I get smashed in the back of the head, smashed into the wall, breaks my nose. As I fall backwards unconscious, boot to the face, breaks my jaw. G.G. Allen. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, was his, that was his style. Yeah. I mean, my nose, my mom cried. I was on a plane 12 hours later. My nose was across my face. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I spent a while looking for, for Gigi Allen. I mean, I know it's kind of a scary guy, but um, uh, I, I thought that we, yeah, yeah. Rock and, rock, rock and roll, man, you know? Um, totally in it. Uh, 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 wow. Yeah, that's a, dirty, that's a dirty move here in New York, man. We wouldn't, yeah, I sucker punched you. That's fucked up. 
But listen, no. it's not as though, it, it, you know, like it's not as though, uh, I mean, I mean, look at the guy and look, look, you know, he, he, the guy let, let, a, you know, uh, yeah. Up. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Paul says, congratulate, congratulations on the sobriety. Well, I had 16 years, Paul. I'm not sober at the moment, um, but thank you. It's something I, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Um, what else do we got? Let's see. Um, yeah, everybody was, um, let me see what else. I love dropping acid and listening to, oh my God. Uh, what else? Any Anybody else? Let's go. Um, let me see. Let me see. The shows is legendary. This is interesting. My introduction to Martin was him machine gun drumming next to Bill Riflin. How do you pronounce Riflin? Bill, Bill Riflin, yeah. Riflin, I'm sorry. On the Ministry Live VHS. And then standing on stage with Pig Face, shirt off, talking about getting alligators rammed up his butt. Is it hard to switch between dead serious for one band and fun loving for another? Um, well, I think that. Uh... Yeah, we had an incident in New Orleans uh, that got really out of hand. Um, but uh, I think it's the same thing. I, I, I'm 120% focused on ministry, um, which is, of course, just crazy drumming. But um, but pig face is the same thing. It, uh, the, the fun that comes, people might smile more on stage with pig face, but it's brutal. It's, it, you know, people are getting cracked ribs on stage. We might play for an extra hour, which is a lot of fun till the next day, you know. Um, uh, so I, I, all of this stuff is all deadly serious. It's joyful, right? But it's not, it's not comedy versus serious. It's joyful it's coming from the same place. Got it. A request to see the shirts behind you, I guess. Some of those great shirts. Behind me? Well, yeah. oh, there you go. That's uh, 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 this is uh, we talked about the damage manual a tiny bit. That's the original part of the original hammer backdrop for the damage manual. That's the one of the dollar bills from the killing joke, Money is Not Our God scenery. That's the first scenery that I made. Um, this is just that's a pig face stay the fucking side shirt. Sure. I can show you. Oh, where is that? Okay, it's over here. Um, let me see if I can. I don't want to undo my Wi Fi here. This is some interesting stuff. If you can get this out of the way. Uh, if anybody listened to the Flowers of Romance album, this here, that's the Mickey Mouse watch. Boom, 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 boom. I bought that at Disneyland on the tour in 1980. Um, and that's, as I said, that's the shirt I wore. Um, this is a, a, a plastic trumpet I bought in Paris. And it opens up. And inside that trumpet, it's ridiculous. It plays miniature plastic records of trumpets. So <laughs> you, blow, you blow in the end. It's a little diaphragm. And it starts a little record player. And that is on um, – that's on the Flowers of Romance album as well. Right on. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let, me, uh, let me bring on a couple of our guys, and, uh, and we'll wrap it up. Stephen, how you doing? What's up? What's up? Hey, Stephen. What's going on, bro? Rap Bones. What's up, Rap Bones? Hey, yo, what up? You got anything for Martin Rap Bones? Yo, Martin. You know what? You restored my faith in my heroes today. <laughs> like, you know, earlier I was thinking, you know, you know, guys like that had to put up with guys like me on tour being so excited to be like about the punk lifestyle and all. And we'd probably come up like, wow, on you. But you guys were like that too. So that like, you know, you guys were out of the box. And we also, the singer of Cold as Life, Ron Beauty, and I also kicked Gigi Allen's ass in Detroit. Bad. Like back when it was like, the punk rockers, a couple of normal people, and some bikers at the bar. Like, that was the punk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I got my – I'm a nerd. I got my 
my Johnny Rotten OG shirt. I was going to say my Matlock, but you also deserve it, my man. You know, I mean, it's like meeting my a hero. And I just want to ask you two things real quick. Did you grow up loving craft work and Devo? Obviously, right? Yeah. And I just want to ask you a little obscure question. Uh, you know, you're kind of industrial and everything. You come from that grip. Do, are you hip to noise core? And a band called Psycho Sin from Jersey City, New Jersey, and their famous record is called You Axed For It. Oh, no. I mean, I'm into anything except, right. I mean, said except country and western. Yeah. <laughs> I, I only say them because, like, they used to go to CBs and the skinheads would hate on them because they would be playing oil drums and stuff like that and just wearing skinhead wigs and causing trouble. Which was very drunk at the time. I, you know? love that I used to see um, who was Todd A with uh, uh, Cop Shoot Cop. Yeah. Uh, Foundation. Yeah. In St. Mark's Place. Oh my! We're in the audience. And they're just firing lit cigarettes at us. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, those, those, those uh, Cop Shoot Cop. I remember. I saw a couple of shows. Those, they, and of course, Missing Foundation. That was that was really that that was really something else. You know, one of my favorite New York shows was Great Gildersleeves with Pill in 1980. Oh, oh, hold on a second. <laughs> hold on. Wow, that's a good one. I mean, that was like you know, we had security, but when you had with John with his thousand yard stare. We didn't yeah. need security to keep people back. There was like a force field around the band. And so we could have used that more than really gotten into, you know, really breathed on people. And that's what we did at Gildersleeves. It was fucking brilliant, you know. But yeah. Now, let me see. I have that, actually. It's, it's pretty small. But wait, this is actually a real, this is a real collector's item here. How about this is... It's pretty small, but wow. Pill tonight, great gilded sleeves. One of the handwritten flyer from oh, that God. night. You know, one of those put write the flyer and put it up like on St. Mark's. You know what I mean? And Incredible. We, we hey, should have done that in it. We had a day off in every city. We should have done a, a show like that. We should have played in somebody's basement. That's what Johnny Rotten should have been doing. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. Where yeah. is now, Stephen? Hold on, Stephen. Before I bring you on, let me I say one last thing before I get out of here, Drew, because you're yeah, gonna come yeah. down. Go I ahead. just want to say also about Pill. Pill was that era of like you knew someone was punk if they liked Pill, because everyone liked the Sex Pistols. But if you liked Pill, that really was more obscure at that time, you know. And to build it up the way you guys have, congrats! I mean, it's awesome, you know. Like you said. We're all, oh, I'm a little younger than you, 53, but we're still doing our thing. It's awesome, you know? Yeah, good deal. All it's right, Rappos, I'll talk to you in a bit, buddy. Right. Thank you. Love you guys. Love you, man. Take care. Hey, Steven. Hey. I see that you sent me, you sent me something during the show, something with Raven on it, right? This, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I thought he'd get a kick out of that. That was... Wow. Uh, during his stay with Prong. Oh, that's uh, right. He played, he played with Tommy in Prong. Yeah, and you know that was uh, my, my drums were louder. I mean, I played with Andrew Weiss, Clean, fucking John Wobble. My drums were louder when I played with Raven. And if you look at digital audio, you can see the difference between we just used to lock in and uh, and from this time. Got anything? Got anything? Now, I Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I definitely. Um, we were kind of chatting in the in the private chat. Uh, I mean, you had a chance to play with people like Danny Carey and Andrew Weiss, and you know, obviously Johnny and Al Jorgensen. I mean, uh, did, like, your game has to just constantly be be on ten every time you play with with people like this. Like, what was the like, like you know, you you have people like like Johnny and Al, like. What was the most intense for you? Is it, I mean, you know, do you, like, what was like, do you remember a moment where you're like, this is like, just your playing was, was at its absolute best? Um, I, I, I want to say just before I quit, don't joke, because 
you know, if you listen to big old rhythms, then you add five beats for the Skeletons album. It's fucking ridiculous, you know. Then, um, so, so, that, sometimes I would leave my body. I'm like, how can I breathe? How can I, where can I breathe? But some of those beats are so insane. Um, <laughs> But, but playing with all of us has been amazing. 10,000 people in LA with riot police on horseback, helicopters, uh, German shepherds on stage across Japan. German shepherds on stage. Mm. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's been pretty, it was, it's been pretty crazy. Yeah. Cool. All right, cool. All right, Stephen. Talk Listen, to thank, you thank you. Yes. Thank, thank nice you for being peace, here. Steven. Amazing, home, amazing get home stories. Safe. I'll see you guys later. Thanks, Thank you. Man. Well, there you go, man. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Thanks. I, I enjoyed and, that. And I'm going to see you tomorrow. <laughs> see you tomorrow. Awesome. Um, anybody you want to uh, please shout out on the way out, remind anybody of anything? Uh, well, tomorrow night we've got the documentary stream screening and the Q&A. Um, please consider supporting my students who are putting this together. I think it will be great for them to see a bunch of people come out and see that they can actually do stuff and make a difference in this time. And then Saturday, we have the Sweet Smell of Success, um, the all-day music conference with Scratch and Sniff. <laughs> Get over to Drew's house and share. <laughs> Look, just like the old days, have a sniff with Drew. There you go. You're all you're all welcome to come over to my studio apartment. Once again, thank you so much, Martin, and and I'll I'll see you tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, good deal. Thanks, Drew. My pleasure. Take care. See ya. Well, there you go. Great show today, Martin Atkins. Fantastic. What a great guy. Um, it's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live Ski, sponsored ski by. New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, and your core hardcore fan page. Shouting out Pitchfork and Fryette. Um, what else? <clears throat> Let me take a minute or two here to just... Yeah, Martin. Uh, yeah, that was a great show. It's great. Great guy. Thanks up there in Canada, Mark Tulch. Yep, good show. Uh, Lori Dawn, listen, it's great because you guys are a part of it. It's really what makes it great. Um... Uh, Gina, yep. 20 minutes away. Yeah, everybody come party at my crib in my studio apartment, right? Uh huh. There you go. Um, Steen, great show. I hope you're well in Denmark. Upstate Rick, I love you, bro. I hope you're feeling okay. Um, and thank you so much, you know, for all that you do. Uh, I, I feel like a creep ski. I'd feel like a, like, like, hey, Garth, what's up, Garth? My man. Oh, I love when the lurkers come in from, from in from the cold. What's up? Yes, Boris. It is I, Drewski. Um, yeah, it was a smart, enthusiastic crew. It's great. It's great when we have guests like that on, man. Like, and we we have such a, a great bunch of people that, you know, that ask questions and stuff. Hey, what's happening, Bob? How's Sunnyside Queens? I love you too, bro. Um yeah, no trolls. You know, that last show that we did, uh, we found out who was, you know, who was causing trouble. You know, it was this, it was this guy that's like a, a YouTube wannabe, like he has a fantasy. Um, and if you look at his videos, it's kind of creepy. It kind of seems like he might have a little mental illness. So listen, it comes with the territory, right? I mean, we're doing a show. It's worldwide. Thousands of people watch this show now. You know, weird weirdos are going to show up once in a while. What what can you do? Um, you know, we're no scrubs. He's a lurker ski, you know, um, a little. Yeah, and yo, Larry Kelly with the assist. Larry Kelly, got to give it to you, man. Figured out who it was and sent me the link. And, and we, yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, Kevin, on the last show, there was somebody that was in the chat room that was continuously posting um, you know, nasty stuff and he would get blocked. And what he would do was, which is incredible that, that he put this time in, he would get blocked and go start a new YouTube 
username so he could come back in and say more nasty stuff. And he would get blocked. And this is, we, we blocked him 10 times. Listen, it's all silliness anyway. It's all nonsense, but it is a little disrupting. Rat bones, you'll fight him? Good. All right. Yep. Good. Rat bones, you know? That's good. Um, a troll. I guess that's your... Yeah. Wouldn't last in real life. Look, the dude was ill. I looked at some of his videos and he it was like sort of creepy, you know? But, um, but yeah, that's what's up. Um, what can I say? Uh, got a bunch of great shows coming up. On Sunday is Laz and Dave from El Nino. Uh, a week from today is Keith Burkhart from um, Cause for Alarm. November 22nd, Jay, Jay Peter from Mind Force, and then Eugene Robinson. We got Moby coming up, Glenn Matlock coming up, Mike Judge coming up. Holy mackerel. We got some great shows. Got some great shows. Steve, man, you nailed it early in the show. I got to give it, got to give you yours. Uh, great show. How about a shout out to the Circle Jerks? Circle Jerks group sex reissue hitting number 73 on Billboard's top 100 this week, 40 years later. Wow. Oh, you know what? I think it's the, what is it? The 27th anniversary of biohazard urban discipline. I think Greg Shosky. Thank you, comrade. Um, interview Chucky Brown. Chucky Brown was on the show, but we could bring Chucky Brown back. Um, hey, Rat Bones, you think we could find this dude and give him a beating? Man, listen, I got to say something. I don't want to threaten people because we're like on a family platform, kind of. Uh-huh. It's kind of. All these people that talk shit never will come up and talk shit to us, okay? We know That's who right. our friends are, and we don't talk to each other and, like, backbite like that to each other. And one more thing. Most people that say shit like that, you're out of our scene, man. You ain't on our streets with us. You don't see what we do or where we're at. So well, Absolutely. Absolutely. Larry Brown, Larry Kelly, excuse me, gets the gets the assist because he he figured out who the guy was and tracked him down and sent me the link. Yo, the guy's got nothing to do with our scene, nothing to oh, do with hardcore. Did you see hey, us Charlie on? Crespo? Kelly. I love you, Charlie Crespo. Check it in. Ooh, now it's now it's for real. All right, good. Yeah, I'm not a tough guy. You know, I'm not a tough guy, Drew. But come on. Yep. Listen, you know, haters will be haters. Get Karen Crisis. You know, that, that would be interesting, Karen. You know, but you know what it is? Honestly, and I've said this before, we gravitate to people who want to be a part of it. And a lot of the people that come on the show have seen the show and, and genuinely want to be on the show. So that's kind of who we gravitate to. I mean, sure, there's instances where I'll go and, and you know, outside the, the sort of, uh, you know, to, to get somebody, but we gravitate to people that want to be here, not people we got to chase down and convince. I'm sure Karen Crisis knows nothing about the show, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean her number's not going to come up someday, you know. So that said, um, how's this? Oh, Jazz from Killing Joke. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. Troll gets the gas face. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Karen, listen. I Karen is good people. And she's a very interesting person. So, um, you know, that said. All right, Rap Bones, let me wrap it up. I'm hungry. Hey, don't forget me when Mike Judge comes in. Uh, the big shows, I want to come on those. But I love Mike, you know? Listen. The well, I, listen, let me just say this. Hold on. Rap Bones! Oh. <laughs> Rap Bones! <laughs> All right. All right, I'll talk to you in a bit. Sure everybody, work. Hey, you okay over there? I'm good. How about yourself? I see you. I see you. What are you, what are you trying to gnaw? You, what are you trying to trying to gnaw your arm off? I'm, like, I'm handcuffed to the thing. I'm trying to chew my way out. What is that called when you wake up with some chick and when you, you gnaw your arm off? Like <laughs> we've you all been there. You wake up. You wake up and your arms are right. You wake up in the morning after the you know you're sort of like and you, you gnaw your arm off so you can get away. <laughs> Listen, we do. These are the things we do. Listen, man. In this day and age, I don't think I gnaw my arm off. I'd just be happy, you know? That's true. I only got four fingers left. So now they, anytime, uh, anytime I have sex with some weird, strange person, I'm just, I'm just thrilled. <laughs> the stranger, the better. The All right. Spice of life, right? Coyote ugly. That's what it was. Coyote ugly. Listen, you know? Chico, you missed a great show, bro. Missed a great yeah, we show. Did. Yep, yep. 
All right. Well, cool, man. I mean, we, I feel like we, I feel like we covered a lot. <laughs> he, he was a, I mean, what a resume. Like we, yeah, it was great. It was great. Just one more reminder to everybody. This is happening tomorrow. Come be a part of it. If you want to hear Olago talk more about himself, <laughs> you know, yep. There you go. Yep. There you go. All right. Let me get rid of this. I'll talk to you later, Stephen. All right. There you go. Thanks everybody. Great show. Um, I will see you on Sunday with uh, Laz and Dave from El Nino. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow on the, uh, on the screen. Sorry, that was a little premature. <laughs> Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow um, for, the, for the Alago screening. I, I love our community. I love you. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Until then, do good things, and good things will come.